Back in the 1995-1996 Premier League season, Steve McManaman assisted 15 Premier League goals for Liverpool. Little did we know at the time that only two players had done so before him, and Frank Lampard is the only English player to have done so since. That campaign remains one of Liverpool's finest and most overlooked seasons in the Premier League era, one where McManaman was the driving creative force in a side who came much closer to the title than people remember. In this special episode of Story Behind the Numbers, brought to you by Fink Markets, an official trading partner of Liverpool Football Club, Steve joins Duncan Alexander and myself, Graham Bell, to discuss how football in the 1990s was different to the present day, how close-knit that team was, and look at his rise to become arguably the most naturally creative English midfielder of the 1990s. This episode is brought to you by the official partner of Liverpool Football Club, Think Markets, a globally recognised online broker. Head to thinkmarkets.team for more information. All trading comes with a risk. Please ensure you fully understand the risks before trading. So, Steve, thanks for joining us uh, today to talk about, obviously, the story behind the numbers of your career. I just want to take you back to that 95-96 season where, obviously, you, you had a huge impact on that Liverpool side, 15 assists during that season, the most you had in a Premier League season. But for, for some of our younger listeners, and dare I say, as we, <laughs> we sort of move further into the history of the Premier League, some of our not-so-younger listeners as well, what, what was it like playing in the buzz of that era? Like The Premier League had really begun to find its feet as the new yeah. top flight in English football. The game was changing. What was it like to be a player, not just in that league, but making such a huge impact on the play at the time? I didn't necessarily uh, feel that I was making a huge impact. All I wanted to do at the time was just help help my team, really. That's all it was. Uh, as, you, as everybody knows, as you boys know, Liverpool are there a magnificent history uh, in winning leagues and being successful. And we felt that we needed to be successful when you play for Liverpool. So that was the only, was the only thing on my mind at the, at the time, trying to take Liverpool to a trophy, trying to take Liverpool to preferably to win in the league. Again, they won it, as we know, in, in 90, and they'd had huge success in the 80s, like everybody, like the teams in Liverpool had huge success in the 80s. So I was used to that when I was growing up. Uh, Everton, Liverpool at Wembley, Liverpool lifting the league trophy. So when I got into the first team, it was all about being successful. Uh, not necessarily for myself, of course, because if the team is successful, that would normally come along with it. So we won in 92, the FA Cup. Uh, we won the League Cup in 95. So it was, it was again, it was building. But, the, you know, the, the, the main one was, um, was trying to win the league. So the 95-96 season was built on trying to drag my team, trying to make my team, trying to help my team uh, get to the top of the league. That's all it was. And if I um, had assists, that was great. If I had goals that assist, uh, that was great. Anything that I could do to help us move forward as a team was the most important thing. And you felt, going back to your first question, you, you felt from 92 every single year moving forward, you felt the league was growing. You felt it was getting bigger. You felt the press... Um, the press were getting bigger. There was more uh, newspapers. There was more television coverage. There was more uh, interest in the game. So you could feel that um, the football was was certainly getting bigger and people were noticing it more and it was becoming more accessible to more people. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think 95, 96 feels to me in some ways quite a, a key season because it was the first year after they reduced the the league from 22 down to 20 teams which obviously it has been ever since um and i think you can almost class these first three seasons as kind of a bit of a hangover from the old first division but i think 95 96 you obviously you had teams like liverpool you had players like you and we, we were after the 94 world cup then which i think was a bit of a, a step forward for people referring to stats and numbers you know assists had become a thing by then because you know they were like fancy football um, games you could play in newspapers. You had to send off by post, uh, a bit different to, to these days, but um, you could still do it. But I mean, I think just to put your season in context, you know, 15 assists. Um, Frank Lampard's the only English player to have got that high ever since in the Premier League. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a really, and the record is still only 20 in a season. So it was, you know, it was really groundbreaking stuff. Um, and also that, 
that Liverpool team, I think, was was really impressive because it still remains the only team in Premier League history to use fewer than 20 players in a single season. Only 19 players were were used by Liverpool that year. And I think that team gets wrongly um, sometimes, you know, described as, a, you know, it had a few, you know, the Spice Boys stuff. But, like, to, to get through a season with only 19 players shows just how sort of hard yeah. that team was and and committed um i mean obviously you'll know that but but yeah does that does that strike a chord yes i think so i think it does i think we were unfairly labeled at the time because we didn't win i mean we got labeled that because we probably didn't win the league <laughs> you know i know teams now that in the Premier league that haven't won a trophy for 30 40 years yet we won trophies it's just that we didn't win the league and when you don't win the league or certainly when you didn't win the league in that mid 90s team you got labeled with various things I think nowadays, if you look, if you don't win the league, it's just because you were beaten by a better team. And that better team, invariably at the moment, is Manchester City. And if you finish second to Manchester City, people still think it's an achievement. Where if we finish second or third, it was considered a failure because, I don't know, because people perceived some players who went out, which of course was ridiculous. You know, because I'd be the first person in the team to call people out if they were not professional enough or going out when they shouldn't be going out. So I knew a lot of that was a load of nonsense. So I feel that they were unfairly labelled. Listen, the Spice Boys thing, I, I, I couldn't care less of. That's probably because we lost the, the, the FA Cup and wore those silly suits at the time. But <laughs> the fact that, you know, it's sort of, you know, people may have labelled it in the, in the 95, 96 season before the FA Cup or even afterwards. I just thought it was, it was unfair on the players. It's just we came across, you know, better teams over a, over a league over a league period over the nine ten months of a season that's all it was. Once we won, when we played them individually, many times we beat the teams who won the league. Many times, and we were much better than them on occasions. But you have to do it over a consistent basis, and I think that's where we just fell. But that's where everybody falls. There's one loser, and everybody excuse me. There's one winner, and everybody else loses. And uh, unfortunately, in the nineties, we just couldn't get over the line. But we were certainly successful in qualifying for Europe. Um, it's not the four places like it is now where everybody thinks it's this, um, you know, this, this thing to, uh, to finish fourth and you're, you're shouting and screaming on the pitch. You know what? Back then it was it was first or it was first and second. Or, you know, if you were in other, other European trophies, they were just as important, if not more important than, I don't know, the Europa League now, because, of course, the way the Champions League's exploded. Um so we were successful. Uh, it's just that we weren't successful enough when it comes into the annals of um, the history of Liverpool Football Club. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, just to put some some numbers around that, there were uh, you, David James, and Robbie Fowler played all thirty eight yeah. games. You had John Barnes. John Barnes at the end of his career, essentially playing thirty six games, assisting ten times, and scoring three goals. So, you know, that's a again. I think. I do think the numbers from that Liverpool season is one of the kind of great forgotten seasons yeah. in a way. And obviously that you then had the the iconic win against Newcastle mm. towards the end, you know, which I guess didn't help them either um, in terms of their their title bid. But no, well, I, but yeah, it was uh, really as good. you said when you analyse the numbers, and of course people don't go back and analyse numbers, do they? It's it's not. It's not cool enough. It's 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 easier to just go. Ah, oh, they never won, or they were, you know, they were this, or or they used to enjoy themselves too much. It's easy, but as you as you maintain, if you are not professional, if you are not looking after yourself, you don't play thirty eight games. You don't play, you know. What I think I played one hundred and seven games in a row. I think at one stage. So you know, you have to look after yourself. You have to achieve a level of importance to get into the team all the time. You have to stay fit. You have to look after your body. So uh, it's easy just to dismiss times without, as you just said, without looking at the facts and going, actually, when you look at these stats, it shows what they achieved. All right, they never lifted something at the end of the season or we lifted the league trophy. It, but, you know, what did they actually do? And when you look at it, 19 players, as you mentioned, who, who played the majority of games, who finished high, who, who put in some wonderful performances, who scored lots of goals and entertained. I think it's a credit to uh, to a lot of the players in the team, to be honest. Yeah, and it, it kind of it sort of feels like there was a great team spirit around at that time, and none more so than you with uh, none more none more so than you with Robbie Fowler. Obviously, of those fifteen assists that season, seven of them went towards goals for for Robbie Fowler. What was it? What was that relationship like on the pitch? Was it almost like a 
a, almost like a telepathic understanding almost that you knew where he was going to move for you to yeah, to get the but best to be to be very honest that um that should it should be like that if that makes sense you know um if you go back to sort of the era of, of, of let's say now you know kevin de bruyne doesn't necessarily have a well whether you think he's got a telepathic relationship with somebody else he just puts it into an area and expects his teammates to be there and that was all I would do, to be very honest. I would know where my centre forwards are going to be. So I ne wouldn't necessarily have to look. I'd just put it somewhere and expect them to be there because I've played with them for many years. I've trained with them for every single day over a number of years. So I should know where their movements are. And the, likewise, the people around me where I play, if I play on the right, I should know what my right back wants to do, whether he wants to overlap, whether he wants to just follow me. And he should know what I, what I want to do. And that's the, that's the understanding of football. If I'm one-on-one -on -one with a left-back, I don't want my right-back come running and bringing in another defender with him. So, you know, it's, it's all of those instinctive movements at the time um, that, that, you know, that makes the team as good as you can. You have to just play to what you, what you think your teammates are going to do. And if, so my understanding with Robbie Fowler was great. I mean, I, was, I knew Robbie before, way before we got into the first team. You know, when we're talking about him, we're very good friends. We were very good friends. We're very good friends now. So, you know, I, I did have a special relationship with him as well because he was, a, you know, he was a really good mate of mine. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the best strikers that the Premier League's ever seen. Still, the only man to score uh, four left-footed goals in a game, and he uh, he did it twice. So, um, pretty pretty decent. <laughs> was good, it was a good left foot, to be fair. Um, Talking to strikers, your your first or your second ever Premier League assist was for Ronnie Rosenthal, going back a bit, and your final one for Liverpool was for for Karl Heinz Reed. I mean, we obviously talk about Fowler and Michael Owen and, and Stan Collymore a lot, but you know, thinking of those two players, who is there anyone that you think is kind of underrated or slightly overlooked from from your time at the club? I played with some great. I mean, Ronnie Rosenthal was was I played with him when I was like seventeen in the reserves, and I played up front initially. Uh, when we won, we won the, the 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 Central League trophy as it was back then, the Reserve League, and that was my sort of in it the start of me playing big boys football. You know, I was 17, 16, 17. You play at the stadiums, you know, you play with the. It's not like now where you know the the, the first team plays. If you don't play on a Saturday, you you played. You know, we played in the reserves. If you didn't play on a Saturday, you played in the reserves because you needed to keep going all the time. So the Reserve League. Was incredibly powerful. You were playing against England internationals who uh, were coming back from injuries. So, the start of my career, the introduction to my 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 proper playing men's football was was playing off from with Ronnie Rosenthal. So he, he taught me a lot. Actually, he was a lovely fella. Um, no, I think I think when you play for Liverpool up front, you know you can go through them. I don't think anybody was underrated. You know, Michael Owen mightn't get the love he, he probably should have deserved now, but, you know, we, we all know why. Um, but he was a great centre-forward. You know, Rushy, oh my God, you can't, what can you say about Rushy? You know, Stan plays, but he was there for about two years, I think. Carl Heinz Riedler came in on the back of, you know, winning, winning the Champions League, of course, with Borussia Dortmund and being a superstar. And he was a lovely, lovely fella, and I still keep in touch with him now. So I don't know whether you can say that, they're necessarily underrated. I certainly didn't underrate them. Whether people underrated them as, as fans, probably, because the longevity of, of being a, a, at a football club probably makes you more important or less important than other people. But I certainly didn't underrate them as players. If you play for Liverpool as a centre forward, you deserve to be there and you're a superstar. So let's throw it forward to the modern day then. Is there any current Liverpool player that you would think that maybe you would have combined best with as well? I think they're all really good players, aren't they? They may play a different style, but you know the the fact that you know they've been so successful of late suggests that they are the best around, you know. And um, you know whether it was Sadio Mane, whether it was Mo Salah, whether it was Firmino, you always feel. I mean, I was a, a creative type of player. I like to think, and I wanted to excite, and I wanted to take people on, and I wanted to play football. So I would feel, without being egotistical, that I could be able to play with these type of players. So I was very good with the ball. Um, and I think, you know, the Thiago's, the Trent Alexander's, the Andy Robertson's, who all, who all seem so comfortable with the football at the feet. I would feel as if I could play, you know, with, with, with them all really, or I would enjoy playing with them all because, you know, that's the type of style of football that I always wanted to play. 
And that's the style of football I always want to watch, always want to watch, which is the most important. Um, and that's why I'm you know, so proud, really, to play in, for Liverpool because the heritage and the history suggests you have to play a certain way all the time. And I think it's really important. I really do. I think there's certain clubs around the world that have to play that type of football. And um, I'm glad Liverpool are one of them. Join Think Market traders from around the world for quick and easy access to a wide range of markets, including Forex, CFDs on equities, commodities and more. Visit thinkmarkets.team to open a demo or live account now. One thing about the amount of numbers there are in the modern game, which I know, you know, it can get overused sometimes and can overcomplicate things maybe, but... I think what is good is that you now do get players across every position who do get the credit they, they deserve. You know, someone like Thiago, you know, doesn't necessarily score a ton of goals or, or get a load of assists, but you can actually now quantify what he brings to the team, uh, you know, a lot more easily. And I think possibly going back to the 90s, that wasn't really the case. You know, the, everyone remembers the, the goal scorers, but even even the assists, I think, you know, that wasn't such a big thing then. And, and it's yeah. what's good about bringing it to light now, I guess. And I think... By the time you left Liverpool in in 1999, it, we, if we look at the most assists in, in Premier League history from you know from August 92 when it started up to August or July 1999, um, the top let's go top five reverse order for for most assists in the Premier League in that era. So in fifth place, Ryan Giggs, um, you know, not surprising. Fourth place, Teddy Sheringham. Third is Eric Cantona with 56, and then joint first with 58, um, Matthew Letizia. And a certain Steve McManaman. So essentially, when when you left the Premier League, you were the most creative player or joint most creative player in the whole league. And I think I don't think you know anyone who watched you week in out week in week out would know that. But I don't think necessarily the the wider public probably realised just how you know how much of an impact you'd had on the club during the decade. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. And I, again, the fact that three of the players were certainly. I'd all play for Man United and all won, all won trophies. So that sort of clouds over what they, you know, they didn't need to have this thing of assists mm. because they they were lifting trophies every year and Teddy was scoring goals and Eric was scoring goals and so was Giggsy to a certain extent. Um, where me and Latisse probably had to do other things because <clears throat> we had to try and elevate our team from here to, to here. Um, and... You know, I think that's why. You know, that with all respect to Southampton, they were they were it was it was harder for Latisse. So he was more of the standout player. He was more of the number one player, wasn't he? He was, you know, the the, the most important player their team ever had. Um, and you know that that was great. And you know, met, you know, I, I'm I'm not tapping myself on the back. Of course, as I said to you before, I wanted to help my team. And you know, whether I got 58, 59, 43, wasn't it? I'd love to have more trophies. You know, you know, I, I would, I'd, I'd be more than happy to have finished tenth in that list and to have lifted the mm. Premier League. Um, so yeah, it's it, it, it's you know, it's nice, it's nice to know those things now. And um, you know, it's um, you know, I, I, I'm with you. I like I like some of the stats. I don't like loads and loads of the stats, but um, it's it's great looking back. And I like to pick pinpoint certain stats to look at because. As a footballer, I feel certain stats are more important than others. So it's it's great to look back and um, and study these and, and and see the impact players had on, as you said, on the less the less important teams. You know, that's when you realise how good players are. Really. Just on that point, what what stats do you look at then in particular? I'm just thinking, like for a listener trying to understand how Steve McManaman views a game of football, we all have our own favourites. But obviously, you've got your stats that you're going. Okay, this is telling me why I believe a player is bringing additional well, impact. I just think, it, for instance, if you look at the, if you look at the World Cup now, which is on, as, we, as we're speaking, stats are getting put up on the screen every five minutes while the game's still going on. You know, uh, ball retention, ball, and I'm like, well, I can see the game. I, I, I don't need to know how many times someone's received a pass <laughs> or somebody's retained the ball or somebody's tackled somebody. I can understand looking at the game, you know, what I need to know about it. So, you know, of course, I'll look at appearances, I'll look at goals, I'll look at, you know, assists now, I'll look at, you know, um, you know, d- depending on the result. I mean, again, depending on the result, 
you know, when teams lose, it's all they, they never ran as much as the other team. But when they, if they win it and they never ran as, as much as the other team, no one cares about it. So you just have to put things mm. in a lot of context. I read all the stats, of course, but I only take out ones that I think are necessary because it's easy just to hit a team when you lose a game and go, ah, oh, they never sprinted as much as the other team. It's like, well, you know, but when they win the following week and don't sprint as much as the other team, they don't go, ah, oh, see, they didn't sprint as much as the other team, but they've won today. So it's just it's just playing devil's advocate with the stats and looking at the scoreline and seeing how well they're playing and seeing the opposition and seeing whether they need to or what kind of you know ball possession they had and things like that. Because I think we've had the, I think we've had this all before. You know, Spain have eighty percent but can't score. Man City have eighty percent but win five nil. So it's all, you know, it's all in context, really. I'm, to be very honest, I like to visually see the game before I before I, before I talk about it because you can get the full flow of, of how the game's going, really. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think we would we would back that completely. Context is everything, and you have to sort of. I think you know, data is best in some ways over a long period yes, of time yes. when you can actually, you know see trends and and see you know when teams were playing well but didn't win and, and vice versa and things like that. I mean, one of the most basic stats is literally you know the formation of a team. Are they playing four four two, four three three, whatever? I mean, you obviously played in an era at Liverpool where the club did experiment with sort of a, a three five two yeah. or a five three two, however, however you want to call it. Did as someone who, you know, generally played out wide in that era, did did that did you like that? Yeah, did it how it. did that affect it. your game? I loved it. I think when you play out wide, um of course you've got a job to do. It goes it goes without saying. But when I played more centrally, I had more of a free role, um, to be honest. And uh whether it, it liberated me a little bit. Whether it helped the team, I don't know. I thought um, I played some of my better football in a freer role because I was more central and I I had the option to play wherever I wanted to play, to be very honest. And that's, that's always a lovely thing to have. You know, we had, we had three centre defenders. Of course, we had the two wing-backs. And then we had two sitting midfielders, John Barnes and Jamie Redknapp or Michael Thomas. And then I sat in front behind the forwards and I was, you know, allowed to go wherever I felt I could influence the game. So rather than play right midfield and play as a right midfielder, and sometimes you might be a little bit stifled because of their formation or because you're stuck on the right. The fact that I could play centrally meant if I felt there was space on the left, I could drift out there. If I, if I felt there was space on the right, I could drift out there. I could try and interact with the, with the centre forwards if they were marked or run past them. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that role, to be very honest. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I love playing as a winger anyway, because you have this personal battle with whoever was left back or right back. And sometimes if I wasn't getting a lot of joy out of uh, on the right hand side, I could switch over to the left hand side and have a go at that at the right back because I could play both sides. And if you had a bit of joy, then I'd stay there or, or whatever the case may be or swap with the other winger. So, um, you know, those personal battles with, with, with the people you come across twice a year or sometimes year in, year out. You know, the Dennis Irwins who played for Manchester United who were faced many times. He was an incredible footballer. And sometimes he got the better of me and sometimes you got the better of him. Those battles, even though you knew each other personally and you knew each other's game, you know, playing against each other and trying to get a result was, um, you know, was, was, was fantastic. It was fantastic. But I really, I did enjoy playing centrally. I must admit, I did under Roy Evans. I thought um, we played really well as a team as well. I thought I thought it I thought it helped the team a little bit. I thought it was um, that formation suited us a little bit. Yeah, I just want to talk about that era where you sort of talk about having that free role. There were certain times during your Premier League career where you were clearly targeted by the opposition to be marked out of games, like we've heard after the fact that Alex Ferguson would talk about each time he came up against you as a player, he said take McManaman out of the game, Liverpool don't play. I mean, what is it, what's it like as an experience when you're going into that, knowing that pretty much you're going to be coming in for incredibly close attention? There is a game plan being built around stopping you trying to play. Well, sometimes it was very strange, to be very honest, because you'd have somebody marking me, but they'd be, if you can imagine here, they're looking at me here, yet the ball is over there, over their back, and they're not paying any attention to the ball at all. So then, and, and I'll say to them, the ball's over there or whatever. And they're saying to me, Maka, 
I've just been told to follow you around the pitch. So it actually, it actually gets, it's quite funny, really, because you're trying to run and get on the ball and they're not interested in the ball. They're just trying to make you not have it. So it then becomes 10 against 10. So you have a little, a little, um, a little bit of a rapport with the person. You're trying to put them off. I'm trying to say, oh, come on, you know what, you know, what a, you can't play like this. Surely this is you not even playing. Don't even want to kick the ball. You just want to follow me around. That, and they'll say to me, that's all I've been told to do. So it was quite surreal, actually. But the main thing was that you had to try and get on the ball. And you had to try and make them foul you, get a yellow card. And then, they, then, it, then the game changes a little bit. Then they, then they become a little bit more wary. So if anyone was ever marking me, I always try, used to try and get it, get them on a yellow card. And my first reaction to my players was, give me the ball again. I'm, I'm going to attack them again. And then you try and change the dynamic of the game. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes we 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 won the game. Sometimes, you know, if you were man marked, they did a good job and they got all the credit for it. So then it exacerbated the situation. It was like, oh, we, they, they man marked them and got a result. So the next team, let's let's try and do that again. So... You had to try and change the odds a little bit where it didn't matter if you were man mark. We won the game. So then the next team that came around dismissed that idea. Yeah, it's fascinating. It just it's one of those things that you're trying to get in the mindset of it. Just I mean, don't go for a toilet break during the game. You probably would have been followed off the pitch and <laughs> it, it did get frustrating at times, you know. It did get frustrating because, you know, you, a lot of the times if your teammates would see you closely marked, of course, they wouldn't pass you the ball. Because you thought you were closely marked, you know, so they'd try and play a safer pass, which of course is, is is very logical. But I wanted the ball, even though I was closely marked. It was like just give me it and let's let's just try and change something about the game. On January sixth, Think Markets, your trading teammate, will launch their competition to win a shirt signed by the Liverpool team. Make sure to follow and subscribe, as we'll be giving you the details on how to enter in our next episode of The Story Behind the Numbers with Liverpool legend Stephen Warnock. Um, we talked obviously quite a lot about 95-96, which I think is the kind of the, the absolute peak of that of that Liverpool team. You, you kind of followed it up the follow, following season with the really good European run, getting to the semis of the, of the Cup Winners' Cup, um, you know, before going out against PSG. You, you nearly pulled off one of those famous Anfield European nights um, in, yep. in the semi-final, 3-0 down from the first leg. But how was playing in, in Europe in that time? Did that, was it much tougher than the Premier League? Was it much different? And, and did that kind of affect your thinking when, you know, you eventually did leave the club in, in 99 and, and moved to, to Europe? Um, yeah, in the end, it, it definitely affected my decision. I, I wanted to play in the, in the Champions League, so it definitely affected my decision. I'd never played in the Champions League, even though we're talking about Europe now. We'd never played in the best competition and I felt my football was good enough to play in that competition. So I wanted to test myself against the best. That goes without saying. So yeah, it did have an impact. Um, it was it was hard. Playing in Europe was hard and we struggled at times. Early on, we got away with um, the Auxerre victory, losing two and and coming back and winning. And then I remember we, we lost against, was it Strasbourg once? We lost against... Was it Dinamo Moscow? I'm trying to think. Bromby. So there were game. I mean, there were certain games where we should have won and we shouldn't have got knocked out. And there were certain games where we were beaten by the better team. But games like Auxerre, which we won, and Strasbourg, and even PSG, I just think at times we were just a little bit naive. You know, I just think we were certain players in the team, the team in itself. I mean, we we had a disallowed goal. We thought it was a good goal against PSG, and that changed the, a little bit of the flow away from home. Um, but maybe we we probably weren't savvy enough in Europe. Maybe we should have shut up shop a little bit more in Europe, um, became a little bit more pragmatic. But whether we had the players to do that is a, is another is another thing because you know we we had creative players who wanted to score goals, and we always felt we could go away from home, score away goals, and then it'll be it'll be good enough. Um, but I always really enjoyed playing. The atmospheres were different than the Premier League, of course. You know, Liverpool's history in Europe was excellent. So you always felt as if, you know, this is a really big um, away game in Europe. You know, and when you played in France or in Italy and places like that, I remember playing Genoa early on. You came across players who, 
you only ever saw that on you know on the television in the World Cup and things like that. So it was a very they were very very special moments. I mean, it's different now as we as we know with the, with the television coverage and the access to all the teams now. But you know, back then to play against Branco, the Brazilian left back, when you played Genoa, you know, things like that were just were just brilliant brilliant to do and and see um, and to travel around Europe playing in all these iconic. Uh, stadiums was was a wonderful was a wonderful uh, experience. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's the last era when before football was a lot more homogenized. Yeah. And you're right that now, I mean, they don't even have away goals now because oh. they've realised it. Kind of, you know, teams can go pretty much anywhere and play as they would normally. Yeah, it's too um, it's almost I mean, too friendly now, isn't it? I don't mean that in in atmosphere wise, but because we know everything about everybody now, there's no surprises, there's no secrets. Everybody's you know. Been to a sta- these stadiums, so actually, whether you're playing at PSG or whether you're playing in Barca, you know most people have visited those places. The fans have all been to those places now, so it just becomes a run of the mill game. It's like, oh, they're playing each other again, or they're playing each other again. You know, Liverpool are playing Real Madrid in the in the next knockout phase of the Champions League. It's like, well, we've played them so many times now. It just becomes quite blasé, doesn't it, to say where it should be an incredibly special game. It's now like, oh, we've met them now three times in the last four years. You know, it's a bit. Yeah. There's no, there's no surprise, yeah. or there's no, there's no fear factor, or you know, everybody's looking forward to going to Madrid. In, in the past, you'd be like, oh my, you know, this is a massive game. Are we going to win? Are we going to get knocked out? Where now it's just a trip away for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Real Madrid. There, obviously, that was the the club you went to. Did. Um... You know, obviously did some amazing things. Won the European Cup, scored scored the winning goal. I mean, but you did play a slightly different role there. Yeah. Was how did that kind of affect? You know, was that something you had to learn? Was it something that came quite naturally? It came quite, um, it came quite natural to me, to be very honest. And I, as we said about Liverpool early on, we started in a in a sort of four four two formation, and I think with injuries occurring and. It was a strange first year because John Toshak was manager and got sacked after a couple of months. And then Vincente came in. And then we had to go to Brazil to play in that stupid tournament that got made up where Man United opted out of the <laughs> FA Cup, which took a couple of weeks out of our uh, La Liga season. So when we came back, we were way down the league. We had you know five games in hand, but we're way down the league, I think. And we had to play a number of games in quick succession. And I think whether... At the time, I'm sure, like Fernando Hierro was injured, and Manolo Sanchez was injured, and then we ended up playing um, five. We ended up switching to five at the back ourselves, and I don't know what it was, but something just something just clicked, and we started to play really well. And um, I think sometimes you get a couple of injuries to key players, and then you try and change your team to adapt to other players, and it just really, really worked for us. You know, Roberto Carlos and Michel Salgado. You know, playing for playing wing backs for them is just the most natural thing ever because they want to go forward, they want to take people on, they think they're you know right wingers, they want to create, and it meant me playing sort of centre midfield with Fernando Redondo, and he was a great player, and um, I always I found it quite comfortable actually. And again, like I said very early on in our interview, if you're very good with the ball, you should be fine anywhere really because your teammates will help you out. You know, if you're right back. You should have plenty of options in the in field because your mates are that good. You know, no one will isolate you. You know, they'll know actually. You know, I'll go and help them. I want the ball. Give me the ball. So there'll be plenty of options. People coming and going, and that's how I felt. Um, Raúl played in front in midfield in the role sort of I played for Liverpool, and again he was a superstar player. And then we had forwards. This was the first year we had. Uh, excuse me. Um, so it it just it just it just seemed to work and. We were very, we, we we became very powerful, and particularly in the Champions League, we showed our um, our metal, and we were really good in the Champions League, where we struggled early on in the group stages. We just clicked, and we turned into a really, really good, strong team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think all Liverpool fans, both now and at the time, probably enjoyed your performance at Old Trafford um, <laughs> with with Real Madrid. Yeah, Robbie was there and couldn't get out, had to be escorted out. Couldn't get out. He was, uh, he was he was in trouble with um, all the Man United fans. But yeah, a lot of people enjoyed a lot of people enjoyed it. To be honest, to knock him out a couple of times was, um, especially the second leg at Old Trafford, was always very very good. Always very. Good. <laughs> 
<laughs> just a pleasurable yeah. moment. That's all it is. Just... <laughs> yeah, Ronaldo gets clapped, clapped off uh, for scoring. And I got the, Did you, I got though? The, Probably not. I got the worst abuse you've ever seen. Thank God my, my Spanish <laughs> players couldn't understand what the fans were singing. And they were singing about, I am a scout, whatever they were singing. But it was actually quite funny. And... Um, I took it as a compliment walking off at the end when everybody was, was was trying to get at me and putting all kinds of fingers up to me as I walked down the tunnel at the end of the game. It was quite amusing. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about sort of nice touches and going back to former grounds, obviously your only Premier League assist when you did return with Manchester City came at Anfield. Uh, muted celebration temptation there? or yeah, just yeah, you know. The only thing... The only thing I wanted to do was not, not lose the game and play play okay. Um, what was what was the score of the game? Did we lose? Did we win? Did we draw? I'm trying to remember. I think draw, City it? won that one. Yeah. Or maybe it was a draw. Yeah. But anyway, the main thing was just to try and play well. Really, that was that was that was all. Um, again, you know, assists assists. You know, are great. Um, but you just want the forward to score. You just want to, you know give them chances, score a goal and then try and win the game. And if not win the game, you, you don't want to lose the game. That's that's the most important thing. Again, it's not, it was never personal. It was always um, to try and help the team, really. That's all it was. I'm going to get our back end to find out what the result actually was. Yeah, we'll get there in the end. It may have been 1-1. One, one. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Or we may have lost them. Yeah, it was in two thousand and four. Obviously, a different, a different sort of city team in in those days. Yeah, just building, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, there is now. <laughs> I think Liverpool won actually. Yeah, did they win? I think it was two, two one. Two one. Two one. There you go. So uh, Michael Owen and Stephen Gerrard scoring the goals. So one, uh, one, two, yeah, one one then two one. Okay, fine. fine, fine. See again. Yeah. That's why I don't remember it. You see, we lost the game, so it means absolutely not. It means absolutely nothing to me. Do you know? <laughs> and a lot of the time, that's the thing. It's always, um, it's always team based. You know, if you ask me about scoring goals, if we lost the game, I probably couldn't remember. There's times I've scored goals, and I'd be like, "Who was that against? Who was that against?" And sometimes you need, you need to be told, "Oh, he's won that," or it was this game. You go, "Oh, yeah," the the, the wider context rather than. You know, seeing yourself score at Anfield or something like that, and you need to know the context of it all, and then and then it brings back memories of what what the game was about and who was against, yeah. what what stage of a cup match or what stage of the league it was. Yeah, I think m- most players are like that. You do get a certain type of striker that can, yes. like, you know, with laser focus, yeah, remember yeah, every yeah. single goal they ever scored. Yeah, but, but they're a special breeds, aren't they, strikers? They're a, they're a special breeds. Yeah, probably remembering the goal bonuses more yeah, than anything. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they live and die on how many goals they've scored, put the poor strikers. So they'll. that's why they steal the penalties. <laughs> that's why they steal absolutely everything, just to make sure. I mean, we've touched on on formations and, and different ways of setting up. And I mean, obviously, if we jump forward to the to the contemporary Liverpool team, it's been a one of the most successful periods in the club's history. You know, getting over ninety points, you know, three seasons is is an incredible achievement. Um, but the way they've kind of set up is obviously very different. I think you know, there a lot of the creativity comes from the fullbacks. Yeah. You know, Andy Robertson's just just equaled Leighton Baines's Premier League record for assists for a defender. Obviously, we'll we'll beat that pretty soon, and, and Trent's not far behind. I mean, I think they're they're only two Trent and and I, Andy Robertson are only two assists away from a combined hundred assists for Liverpool in the Premier League, which is which is mad know. for a fullbacks. Um, do you? You know, do you feel in some ways you were kind of a prototype for a sort of attacking player who was essentially a creative player, but also could could defend? You know, do you think that someone like Alexander Arnold could go on to play in midfield, or do you think that Liverpool are getting the best out of him in the position he is playing at the moment? Um, I, I I don't I, I don't necessarily think I was a prototype because the players who played before me in the Liverpool team were probably those type of players, and I was probably trying to follow in their footsteps. Um, well, I don't. I don't see why Trent would move into midfield. He's the, arguably the best right back around. Is he good enough? Yes, I think most people who are very good on the ball and creative could play in a number of positions. Don't get me wrong, but whether he'd be the best in the world at those positions is another thing. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't even worry about trying to move him in there because it is a different art receiving balls. You know, you're back to play and trying to turn quickly when you're getting 
closed down and, and things like that and having a trick and having a shake of your shoulders. It's very different than playing as a right back and looking up the pitch. So I wouldn't certainly rush him into playing centre midfield when he's when he's he's the best around at this moment in time. So um you know I, I, the fact that him and him and Andy Robertson are um are playing so well is just again one that the, what the manager wants to do. His teammates around him allow him to get forwards. Mo Salah allows him to get round the side or you know, Jordan Henderson inside the pitch is very strong, or the defenders um, to the left of him in Virgil and, and Canate or, or Joel Matip or whoever's been at excellence, and they've got a huge amount of trust in each other. I think it just helps as a as a whole, really. Um, and long long may it continue, and I, I, I don't see I don't see why it shouldn't continue for for a long time. They um, they still look they still look an excellent team. I still think they're going to you know um, recover from their league position where they are now and climb up. Once everybody gets fit and well and back from the uh, get back from the Champions League before the Champions League starts again, so um, I haven't got a huge amount of, of criticism for um, for Liverpool this year. I, I know why they haven't got they haven't accumulated the points that they should have, and I think they'll rectify that in the second part of the year, hoping that everybody stays fit, of course. Let's just go into fantasy land here. January transfer window opens up. Prime Steve McManaman's available coming into the club. Where would you fancy playing in this system right now? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think I could play anywhere really, um, because they play with three up front. You can always, you always feel as if you could play in, in, in sort of in the Firmino role to a certain extent, or it, one of the three across the middle of the park. You could always feel as if you could play in, depending on how wide they go. But if they play with a two and a one, you'd think you could play there. Um, I mean, I always feel Liverpool need a winger. To be very honest, I don't think they've got an out and out <coughs> winger where you feel that they could get to the byline and cross balls in, get to the byline and pull pull balls back. Just when I think that if they are, you know, uh, if they have got a few injuries and, they, and, and they're struggling a little bit, like they were a few years ago when they went through that bad, bad patch at home, you know, they were very one-dimensional. And, and I don't expect Trent to get from right back to right wing all the time. Because I don't think it's fair for them. You can't get up and down all the time. But I wouldn't mind someone who can, if things are not going well with the three up front, then to do something a little bit different. Um, and um, just to change the game, change the defenders' movements. You know, it, it's easy when defenders are just heading balls from Trent that way, looking at the ball. But as soon as you get balls pulling back from the byline and they have to move their body position, I think that would help Liverpool just at times. And it was. Um, it was great to see young Ben Doak come on and do it in the um, in the in the in the Carabao Cup, and I think something like that just to change the the movements of the defenders always helps them. So you could easily play you could easily play in that role. It's just I mean it's hard to you know when you're the best around it's it's hard to add something better. Um, but so this is just a plan B of how to change the movements of defenders if things are not probably going your way, and I think that just helps to have have different options off the bench. Yeah, I think we probably saw that last year with the arrival of Luis Diaz, who I think did did change things up a bit and, and freshen things up in the second half of the season. Natural, and, um, I still don't think he's a natural, natural wing. Yeah. You know what I mean? He likes to attack, of course. Yeah, he still wants to cut yes. inside, yeah, yeah and, and, you know, to... and can shoot yeah. pretty well. Mo likes to come in but... and shoot, and Sadio does. And, and it's, just, it's just somebody a little bit different. And as I said, you mightn't utilise him all the time, but you'd utilise him, you know, if things were not going well or you felt... Actually, we need to do something completely different here to change the flow of the game. We're not getting enough chances, or we're a little bit one-dimensional. That's all it is. But I think um, you know, Lewis Diaz just just changed the team a little bit. Yes, definitely. Well, Steve, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to go diving into the story behind the numbers of your career. Look back on some of your excellent teammates you got to play alongside and really take a trip down memory lane it's been it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, of ours it's today been, thanks it's been really nice yeah thanks dave it's been really nice speaking to you and it's been really nice to listen to some of the numbers that you mentioned it's always nice to get a pat on the back 15 of, assists of, of no one can take that away from you 15 <laughs> assists in one premier league just keep season telling me every other, every other year mate just to remind me that's all that's all <laughs> thanks Here's dave boys, thank you <laughs> cheers 
This episode was brought to you by the official partner of Liverpool Football Club, Think Markets. Head over to thinkmarkets.team to view more great Liverpool football content, enter competitions and see all the latest partnership news.